Tom Fisher intro, take one. Today's guest, Tom Fisher, is someone that I've learned a ton from over the last couple of years. We have a nonprofit together along with a couple other partners called Smart North, which is focused on digital equity and is currently building tech centers in uh, South Minneapolis as well as Deer River, Minnesota. And Tom is the head of the design center at the University of Minnesota. He's a world-renowned expert on human-centered design. And our conversation today really talks about design and metaverse governance, which he just wrote a book on, and how, you know, over the next decade or so, we can use technology, we can use design, and we can use infrastructure, including the government infrastructure money that's coming down right now, uh, to actually make tangible change in the world around us instead of just recreating, you know, spending all this money on building roads and, and not actually changing things, you know, as we have access to all this new technology. So Tom, great to have you on the podcast. Good to be here. I know, I think we met, was it two, three years ago through Sabina and yep. some of the work that we were, we've been doing with Smart North, but, you know, definitely... Definitely been someone that I've personally learned a lot from and, you know, looked up to in, in the work that you're doing um, in human-centered design and um, how that interacts with technology and communities and, and just, you know, so many different things and uh, awesome to be, you know, part of a nonprofit with you. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's been great. Well, I mean, I think uh, Smart North has been a terrific opportunity to uh, expand digital equity. So, yeah, fun. So talk about that, you know, um, I'd, I'd love to maybe just give the viewers a little bit of context around your, you know, who you are, your background and, and how you got here, but also, uh, you know, maybe talk a little about, a bit about that concept of digital equity, because I think that's really where the intersection of our relationship um, has centered on. Yeah. So um, I'm trained as an architect um, and, uh, and also in urban design and planning. And also uh, I have had a long career, both initially in journalism. I was the editor of one of the major architectural magazines in New York for uh, 14 and a half years. And um, so saw the kind of evolution of the, you know, the built environment, writing about buildings, cities. Um, and my magazine was taken over by its competitor in a hostile takeover. And the next day I got a call from the University of Minnesota saying they were looking for a dean and was I interested and I'd never been in a full-time academic position before. So I said, sure. And uh, they hired me as a dean and I was a dean uh, at the University of Minnesota for 19 years uh, of the College of Design, which was uh, all of the design disciplines. Um, and after 19 years, I got a little tired of doing that. And there's a uh, research center at the university that's about 30 years old and that director was retiring and decided, well, I'd like to do that for a while. So I uh, got myself appointed uh, to the, direct the Minnesota Design Center, which is a uh, center that basically uh, looks at um, community-based uh, solutions uh, around not just physical planning, like, like urban planning, and we do a lot of transportation-related research, but also um, the kind of systems and services. And so, uh, you know, I've long been interested in how we redesign the larger systems in this country to be more accessible, equitable, affordable. And, um, and I also, one of my interests I've been writing about since 2010 has been the impact of pandemics mm. on our lives. And so when the pandemic hit in March of uh, 2020, I realized I needed to write something longer about that. So I started working on a book, uh, which just came out last week um, from Rutledge, which is um, on the post-pandemic world. Mm. And, you know, one of the things about that is that um, I think this pandemic that we're still in the midst of, but getting out of, uh, has really shifted the balance of the digital and physical world. And I think as we all saw during the pandemic, um, digital inequities, lack of access to high bandwidth, access to the internet, lack of the digital devices that you need to stay connected really, um, you know, holds many people back from participating in what is uh, fundamentally a digital economy anymore. And so I got interested in the work of Smart North because 
you know, it, it seemed, uh, you know, to be a, a, you know, a voice toward the digital equity issue, also the in, intelligent cities issue, which I also was interested in. We did research in my center uh, around the impact of autonomous vehicles. Mm. So how that's going to change our transportation system. So I've just long been interested in this whole area as part of my being a professor at the U and a director of the center. Yeah, no, wonderful. Um, and perfect timing for, you know, your book launch last week. Yeah. Um, I'd love to, you know, hear a little bit of, m more about the book itself. I know we talked about, you know, a few different things as far as, um, you know, the metaverse and, and governance and, and designing for physical and digital worlds. Um, you made a con you made a comment on the fact that we're now in a time where there's actually kind of, you know, a, a, maybe an equal push and pull between the physical and digital worlds. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so, you know, trained as an architect, of course, I grew up, you know, in my career designing physical spaces. And for really the first time in human history now, people have a choice. Uh, you know, the physical world actually has a competitor, which is the digital world. And, uh, you know, pandemics accelerate us rapidly into the future and they take things that were emergent before and make them dominant. And so we, for example, before the pandemic had online learning, you know, you know, on demand shopping, um, you know, distance education, you know, working from home, tele telemedicine, all of these digitally enabled activities happened before the pandemic, but they were largely somewhat at the margins of our economy. Right. And um, during the pandemic, they became like 80% or more of the economy. And while as the pandemic, the post-pandemic world will probably, will probably step back from that a little bit, we're not going back to the way we were because I think a lot of people recognize the convenience and the advantage of being able to do things remotely or to do things digitally. And um, moving bits around the world rather than bodies. Uh, and so I think that, um, uh, you know, that idea of um, how this pandemic uh, will profoundly change how society works, how our economy works, how education works. I mean, these are all uh, going to be issues that will last for decades to come. So even though this pandemic will end, we hope this year, right. Uh, the the impact of the pandemic is going to go on for probably the rest of the century. And how do you what are what are the biggest, you know, maybe two or three, you know, for the sake of time? What are what are the top areas of impact that you see, you know, really having that profound lasting change on, on society from, you know, 2019 to now 2022 living in a very different world? Well, I mean, I just uh, was giving a talk on the post-pandemic university. So after every previous pandemic, education, particularly higher education, goes through a major transformation. So there was a cholera pandemic in the middle of the 19th century, after which we started to develop large research and land-grant universities to basically address the needs of that post-pandemic economy, the late 19th century economy. After the 1918 flu, uh, where social distancing became important, we developed community colleges. The whole community college system emerged in the wake of that as people wanted educational uh, uh, opportunities closer to where they lived. Essentially, we socially distanced higher ed. And I think you know this um, pandemic is going to lead higher ed, for example, to realize that we can do a lot digitally, um, and which raises the question of who are our students? I mean, if you can have 300 people on a Zoom platform, why only have 20 in your class? Why don't you enable everybody else to also access that class uh, if they have, a, you know, a internet connection? You know, who are faculty? You can bring in faculty from anywhere in the world to right. lecture to your students. Why have a campus? I mean, why not take education to where people are rather than constantly expecting people to go to campus? Right. So these are like big, profound questions just in that one area of education. And the same thing is happening in the business world and in, in the work world generally, which is why I come to your office. You know, I mean, I think there are reasons to do some things in physical space, but they're going to be different from what they were. They're going to be more about 
Um, meeting people who are, you know, you haven't met before, I, th I think that's still important to do face to face. Working on common projects that require you to kind of be there together, uh, have conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of work is best done, you know, by yourself someplace. And it seems to me that the work world will generally be one in, in the future in which most people will be able to do a lot of their work wherever they're comfortable, at home or in some third space, wherever, a coffee shop, you name it. Um, and the office will be this place of interaction, uh, collaboration, and more informal communication. Right. No, and that's interesting. Um, i definitely seen that in, in many different you know, many different areas. Um, and for me as an entrepreneur, I've had a studio space before I've, I've had spaces, but now I don't, I don't know that I'd ever go back to, you know, one cent, you know, maybe yeah. if I have a really big company at some point, but I don't know that I'd ever go back to one centralized space where, you know, I'm, a, I'm in every day. I have a co-working space that I go to. I have right. a studio space that I'll, I'll shoot at if we're doing media work. Um, but I'm, I'm working at coffee shops a lot or I'm, I'm here and we're shooting a podcast in my apartment right now. Right. So it's, um, you know, maybe one of the positive things I would say is maybe we're being more intentional about why we're coming to a space and how we're using it and how we're interacting with humans in it instead of just we have to be in the space because that's what everyone does. Yeah. And the miniaturization of technology has enabled that. I mean, I think that this idea of, uh, you know, like you, I, I carry my whole life in my laptop and my, my digital devices. Right. And so, I mean, it's, we all need places to live and, you know, what have you, but basically um, we, we've miniaturized and mobilized technology to such an extent that it is also changing the way we think about um, our relationships to the communities we're in. For example, hum humans spent 95% of our time as a species being nomadic. Mm. We've only actually lived in cities and permanent buildings for 5% of our time as a species. And it may be that that was, a, that was an aberration. It may be that we are fundamentally uh, more comfortable being a nomadic species than a f permanently fixed species, in which case digital technology now enables us to essentially become digital nomadics. And I think that is a profound shift in our ability to <clears throat> decide where we want to be, who we want to work with, where we, you know, um, and, you know, we're uh, the head of the UN you know, said recently that this is going to be the century of people on the move. Now, he was talking about refugee situations like Ukraine, right. but I think you can also see that more broadly. We are now a population that's enabled to be mobile. And that is a profound shift. 100%. And the concept of, I think it was Tim Ferriss back in, you know, whenever he wrote his first book, The 4-Hour Work we kind of popularized that concept of being a digital nomad in the entrepreneur space, but now you're seeing corporate employees do it. You're right. seeing, you know, the large, most of the large tech companies are semi, if not all remote. Right. So yeah, definitely kind of proliferating out to being an accessible lifestyle for, for many different types of people. Right, yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's huge. And I, and I think it creates a lot of opportunities for people I mean, it, it allows people to live where they, they want to live. And um, I think we're going to see a revived interest in small towns. We're seeing the sort of rise of what are called Zoom towns, which is if you have a good Internet connection, people prefer to live in smaller places. And yet cities are also thriving because there's also, I think, the uh, need for people to also interact. And so I think that um, it's not like we're going to see cities die and, and you know suburbs grow. I think or small towns grow, I think we're going to see just more choice. Right. And that ability to have that kind of choice is what's going to be the defining characteristic of the decades ahead. So talking, switching gears here a little bit, talking about, um, about the metaverse and, and yeah. Web3, right? We, before we hopped on camera, we were talking about, you know, potentially some of the decentralization models uh, of Web3, you know, being kind of a design principle for uh, businesses and cities and, and different infrastructure. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on on Web3 and, and decentralization, uh, you know, as it's starting to become a more of a mainstream thing with blockchain technology? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, we're seeing a phenomenon of the decentralization of, of everything, even as we're struggling with the incredible centralization of power in, say, the big tech companies, right? And so I think that, as we, you know, these transitions are never, you know, easy and it's it's never sort of smooth. But, I mean, I, I always sort of think of Web2 as kind of the, the big tech companies controlling a lot of the information and a lot of centralization of power. And we're already seeing with Web3 this ability to decentralize that power, decentralize the banks through blockchain and cryptocurrencies, which allow us to, you know, have more local power, more local economic power. Um, and I think we're seeing it in terms of information. Um, and I, again, that goes back to the that nomadic idea I was just talking about, which is, um, you know, uh, in, for most of our history as a species, we lived in small tribal groups that basically decided what to do. Um, we didn't have large centralized governments telling everyone what to do. Right. And it may be that as we become more mobile and more digitally nomadic, we also uh, have a much greater flexibility in terms of um, the the power structures that we're a part of. I mean, you know, the, the war we're seeing going on in Ukraine right now is, to me, is such a 20th century war. It's just like one big country trying to take over another country without realizing, wait a minute, you know, everyone can now just leave. I mean, you can take over some land and there may not be any people in it because um, the the ability of, of us to be mobile. And so, I mean, even the idea of taking over country seems like just like you're in the wrong century and not thinking correctly about the way the world works now. So, um, you know, on the, on the blockchain issue, I, you know, I've been working with some colleagues here and uh, economists who are also thinking about local currencies. Um, and some of them are actually kind of critical of cryptocurrencies because they see them as largely speculative. And what they've been working on is this idea of a community-based currency with the idea that there's a lot of uh, uncompensated work that goes on. People volunteer in their schools or in their churches, or they do a cleanup of, you know, the highway or whatever. None of it gets compensated. The idea being that there would be a local currency that would be fungible in local businesses so that you would get compensated for your, the, the volunteer work you did in your local business. And so it's a, uh, again, another way of, it's not so much a cryptocurrency, Bitcoin-like blockchain idea, but it's, again, another example of how people are reimagining economics in much more local, distributed ways. Yeah, and with token models now, it's, you know, cryptocurrency as an alternative to the dollar is one right. thing, but creating a token economy where you're able to capture the value that is being created in, in a you know, a second or third or whatever it is, currency that then can be exchanged as an asset. Um, right. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, I think it's all part of the kind of Web3 mindset, which is um, how do we take power and distribute it, get it lower to where people really are. And, um, and again, I think that that is part of what the pandemic has pushed us toward, which is that I think people have realized that they have a lot more agency to um, to do these kinds of things than they thought they had. Hundred percent. So thinking about the the metaverse and designing for the metaverse, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do we avoid maybe some of the pitfalls that uh, that Web two took? Where you know, again, we had you know a lot of mental health issues with social media. Mm -hmm. uh, again, with a, a lot of great things too, but um, you know, we we definitely saw a lot of psychological implications, um, mm -hmm. economic implications that, you know, centralization of power that, you know, maybe right. wasn't the best for, for humans or for communities, um, or, and not always very equitable too. Right. Um, how do we, you know, maybe take that in a different direction with, with this metaverse or web three concept that we're, we're now coining? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think that that's in, in part why we can't, sort of totally live digitally. I mean, I still think that there is value in the kind of face-to-face -face interactions with with uh, other people. I mean, I, I you know, I'm actually not a big fan of uh, a lot of social media because of the so-called Facebook effect that, that people um, put up, you know, photos of themselves leaving these happy, happy, happy lives, which are fake. And then people seeing that and feeling, well, I'm not that happy, so there must be something wrong with me. And 
and it turns out that everybody gets depressed by that. The, the people who are putting up the fake, fake view of themselves know it's not real, and the people seeing it feel badly about themselves. So the whole thing kind of works in a kind of perverse uh, way. Uh, and so I think that we need to um, make sure that, that, that in addition to the power of social media to connect people, that there are, other, there are multiple ways for people to connect. And um, uh, so, I, you know, I think that, and I don't have the solution to that. I just know that, um, uh, you know, for example, I've been interested with the pandemic because on one hand, we were all living these digital lives. Everything was getting distributed to us. On the other hand, I got to know my neighbors much better because everyone was outside right. walking their dogs, you know, playing basketball in the street because there were no cars. And, and so I, I think that, you know, along with the kind of the digital acceleration comes this kind of acceleration of actual interactions with real people in their in their lived lives. And those two things have to happen together. 100 percent agree. Yeah. And it's you know, we we talk about digital spaces. Right. Um, but just having more technology, more digital, cooler digital spaces, you know, different social media platforms doesn't necessarily solve all the human problems. Right. 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 Uh, we talk about, you know, this concept of, of relocalization uh, that I know you're, re you're really big on. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and kind of how you see communities, you know, relocalizing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mentioned the local currency, but I also think that there is a lot of push in my field, for example, to use uh, local materials um, to recycle um, you know, local products to, to um, sort of support local businesses. Um, and I think that, um, you know, I think these are all efforts to not only have a better social and environmental impact, but are also the ways in which people sort of, again, regain agency from large corporations who have taken over these long supply chains. And the thing about that is I think that we've seen with this pandemic, that that overdependence on long supply chains makes us what I called in one of my other books a highly fracture critical society. Which, you know, fracture criticality is this idea that comes out of engineering, which says that um, you don't want to design a system so that it only works if everything in it works perfectly. You have to design a system to be incredibly resilient, redundant, and more like the way the natural world is organized. Right. Nature is incredibly resilient because of the of the redundancy, and it's also incredibly local. Ecosystems are are local; they're patch like, and so you know, part of where I think we have to go as a human species is to stop thinking of ourselves as separate from or different from the natural world, mm. and to learn how natural systems work, and then think about what are the human parallels to that, because um, that is how we will be resilient. So no other species has global supply chains. No other species is, you know, sending bodies around the world so quickly that we end up with pandemics because some novel virus in China gets on an airplane and it's flown all over the world and all of a sudden we're all sick, right? And so it's like we should be moving bits, not bodies, around the world. We should be uh, being connected globally, digitally, but I think physically we need to actually lead more local lives, stop traveling as much, stop, you know, uh, thinking that somehow we're the exceptional species on the planet because we're not, and think about how do we organize the human ecosystem in ways that are more like natural ecosystems. That's really interesting. And I've heard, I've heard people bring that concept up, but, you know, designing for more again you know uh synergistic i guess um ecosystems buildings communities you know that fit into the natural environment um you know how do you see you know especially coming from an academic perspective um you know i, I know sometimes there's kind of a dissonance between the academic world and the design world maybe and, and the, the business world and how it actually gets carried out um uh, you know do you see a problem with what's happening right now in, in Web3 and in tech um, as far as how people are actually carrying out this design versus how, um, you know, maybe it should be done? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess I, 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 I don't get, may not know enough to be uh, able to uh, answer that, you know, all that well. I mean, I, I do think that um, 
I'm on the American Architects National Board, and I've been talking about the fact that the overall construction industry globally is about $10 trillion. But the the digital world is getting to be that big. I mean, it's it's in in within decade or so, it's going to be, you know, kind of this alternative world that's almost as big as the is the construction world is. And to think about um, how the lessons we've learned in making the city in physical cities work, how that applies to the metaverse. Because I, I do think that uh, there's aspects of, of that that are a little bit like the Wild West. To me. And it's, yeah. it's a little bit wild. And I mean, as we see with all the disinformation and, you know, the bullying and, you know, all the kind of stuff going on. Um, I think that there will be a, a point where we say, look at, you know, there's certain kinds of expectations of behavior. There's certain kinds of regulations that just need to be there so that we, it isn't a violent, hostile, dangerous place. Um, as we have figured out how to do in the physical world, may, we still have a long way to go. I mean, cities can still be dangerous places, but generally most people obey the traffic laws most people are not getting shot and killed in cities. I mean, so we've largely figured out how you have to behave yourself in the physical world. I do think some of those same ideas have to translate into the digital. So more so governance, applying yeah. governance to the digital world exactly. so that we can have a better ecosystem. And that doesn't have to be some big top-down authoritarian governance. Right. It can simply be, hey, look at like, when you drive your car, you stop at the red light, you know, because if, if you go through the red light, you're going to kill yourself or somebody else. I mean, there are just certain kind of rules of behavior right. that we need to put in place that isn't authoritarian and top down. It's simply like this, the, the sort of few set of ground rules will just make it safer and better for everybody. And it's, it's interesting because you're seeing a lot of these communities, at least in my experience, being in a lot of these discords and spaces where web free communities are congregating a lot of them are starting to self-govern and right. you saw for um four or five months you know there was a huge and there still is but there was a huge huge problem with these scams and these nft projects right. and companies just popping up and, and taking right. people's money and, right. but now you're you're starting to see you know uh it, this space is very reputation based and so uh, there's there's less and less tolerance for that, and the community is is really coming after people. Um, right, there can be a lot of self policing. I mean, we used, we've done a lot of work in our college around uh, VR, virtual reality, and of course there's certain rules. Like for example, you know, if somebody has got a VR headset on, uh, you can't like pull the, the ground out from under them. Right. I mean, you know, it, you just, or you can't throw them throw them against the wall. I mean. Obviously, they're not physically being thrown, or but the psychological impact. Right. There's just certain things you could, you don't do that, right? And um, and so you know th these are just kind of self policing things that I think are important. So taking a step back here, I know human. If I remember correctly, human centered design is your, right. your field, right? right. Um, for someone who's who's definitely not an expert on on design, um, but you know really interested in learning more, what would you say? you know, are some of the key points that, you know, I as, as an entrepreneur or someone in the business world should understand about human-centered design? Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's um, how all innovation occurs. I mean, you don't have to call it that, but, you know, design is about envisioning possible futures, about things that don't exist. I mean, when you design a new car or a new shoe or something, it doesn't exist. It, you're envisioning something that's new and for it to be successful in the marketplace, it has to have some innovation, it has to have some improvement. And in the way you do that successfully is through this design process, which is you try to understand the point of view of others, the, you know, whether it's the customers or your clients or, you know, the public, you try to understand, you know, the lived experience of people. So it's not about you, the designer, telling them what they want. It's about you trying to understand what they want and need. And then there's this phrase, uh, this phase of reframing, which mm -hmm. is frequently they don't always know what they want, but you try to get at, okay, let's think about creative ways to reframe that problem. I mean, when, you know, people told Jobs they needed a phone, 
he said, well, but you're also telling me you need a map and you want a camera and you want. And so the idea is, well, why don't you have all those things? You know, it's, why isn't just a, why does it only have to be a phone? Right? right. And so a lot of innovation comes when somebody looks at a problem and reframes it, thinks about it in a new way. And that's that moment where you begin to think about um, what's what else is possible. And then there's a phase of just I idea generation. Okay, let's say we want, we don't want a phone, we want a phone that's also a map and a camera. Okay, let's generate as many ideas as possible about what that could be. And that's another thing that a lot of creative, innovative people do is a lot of people think that, well, to be, you know, creative, there's this light bulb that goes off and all of a sudden the right idea comes. It actually isn't the way it works. Uh, A lot of innovators generate lots of ideas. A lot of those ideas are really bad. But out of those, sometimes the craziest ideas are the ones that really take us in some new direction. And then there's a phase of prototyping, you know, as you do with products, new products. You just, you, okay, let's figure out a low cost way to test this in the marketplace. Does anybody right. want this? And then, and then you evaluate it and maybe you do the whole thing again if it didn't work or if it does work, you go off and start a company and make your millions. So, yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely have a lot of, Bad ideas, but hopefully there are yeah, a few, yeah. few good ones in there. Yeah, I mean, in a way, there's no bad ideas. To me, you know, the thing about it is, what do you do with those ideas? Right. You know, and uh, you know, some some I, bad ideas now may be good ideas in the future. The timing might be it's wrong. Timing, the concepts, whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that's really important, you know, to understand in the space that we're in now, and especially the space I'm playing in, in, in web three is, you know, how to envision, you mentioned envisioning futures, right? And mm-hmm. I think that's kind of what we're, you know, we're all start you know, in this space, we're really envisioning what the future of it is because no one specifically knows, right? right. It's, it's emerging, it's very early. Right. Um, and so if, you know, if we don't have the conversation around how are we in designing or envisioning that future and then what is that future, right? And is it equitable? Is it livable? Is it, uh, is it the experience we want to have, you know, that we just end up growing companies and growing businesses, but we don't actually make the world a better place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's right. I mean, it's, and it's gotta be a better place for others, you know, I mean, it, it, and that's why I'm trying to understand what the real needs of people might be, uh, what they're really trying to get at frequently, what uh, we find when we do this work that sometimes what they'll say, isn't sort of uh, is sort of not exactly what they what they really need, and so part of it is is observing and listening to what people don't say as much as what they do say, uh, or observing the the way they go about their lives and looking for you know gaps or opportunities in things to make their lives easier, and you know this is how humans have you know survived. I mean, we're not as a species we're not particularly fast, we're not particularly strong. But we're pretty good at innovating and we're pretty good at sort of solving problems based on our needs. So, so talking about envisioning futures, t- tell me a little bit about this concept of the, the tech hub or the third space that, you know, and, and for context, Tom and I are, are working on a nonprofit called Smart North, which is, is building a community tech hub right outside of George Floyd Square and another one um, potentially going in, in Deer River, Minnesota, up north. But um I know you really were the mind behind this concept initially, so I'd, I'd love to hear kind of where it came from and uh, why it's so meaningful to you. Well, it was all part of this idea of, you know, how do we get people access to the Internet and to how do we help uh, train people for this digital economy, particularly if they're in households that don't have uh, those, um, you know, services or the the technology available to them. So part of it was, Okay, if you don't have it at home, let's provide places close by where not only you have access to technology, but you can get training uh, there with other people who are also excited about this. And then also with the tech hub is it's not just the technology, it's it's sort of helping their whole lives. So, you know, if you have other needs as well, um, we want to be there for you. So in some of these underserved communities, be they, you know, near George Floyd Square in, in an underserved urban community or Deer River, which is a kind of underserved rural community, people have um, all kinds of other needs. They might be, you know, they might be hungry. They might have some instability with their where they're living. There might be 
you know, all kinds of, they may need help, some tutoring help on their schoolwork. And so, I mean, I, the hope of, with these tech hubs is they're not just a place where you go to get access to a computer and the internet, but it's also a place where you can get other kinds of services provided um, so that it, it deals with the whole person. Um, because I think that um, there are, you know, a lot of these issues are kind of intertwined that households that don't have access to technology often have other kinds of issues um, that um, particularly young people need help with. So that was the idea of it. And um, you know, we've got two prototypes underway. Coming together. Yeah. So I'm excited. I think it will be a good time. Yeah, likewise. I, that was really, for me, coming out of everything that happened in 2020 in, in Minneapolis so with my tech background, I, I really you know, wanted to find a way to make some kind of long-term sustainable impact. So really optimistic right. to see where where these tech hubs go and, and the outcomes we're able to create in, in the communities that we put them in. Um, last question here. So Tom, you know, if you were if you were to die tomorrow, right, what what is the the one thing that you want to be remembered for? What is the one thing that you, you know, hope the world is left with from from your life? Wow. <laughs> I've never been asked that question. Well, let's see. I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, I, I just completed my 12th book. And I guess one reason I write books is that they'll probably outlive me. Um, but, uh, you know, in those books, I've tried to help uh, people reading them get a sense of the, of the opportunities that exist out there. That I, I guess one of the themes in my work is that we designed the world the way it is. And if it's not working for us, we can design it another way. We have that agency to do that. Mm. And that means everything from our, the way our economy works to the way our cities work to the way our, our daily lives are enacted. And that um, we have the ability to change things. And, um, and also, I tried in my work to give us some historical perspective. We've always had that ability. This has been this is what it means to be human, right. which is to envision better futures and then to figure out how we're going to achieve them. And using these creativity, innovation skills we have as human beings to get there. So I hope it's an optimistic message about the future. No, I love it. Yeah, definitely resonate with with that. And envisioning better futures is something I think, you know, we all could do more of. Yeah, good. Thank you for Thanks being for on the show. Yeah, thank you.